Good evening and welcome to our live Q&A with cultural critic Dr Robert Beckford. Now all week we've been running a series about Britishness and our national identity. It's certainly been engaging and you've been getting in touch on social media to tell us your point of view. We've looked at language heritage and the future of Britain and we started the series with our survey which gave us an insight into how you feel about Britishness. And that's where we're going to start our discussion because Englishness versus Britishness has certainly been the subject um, of uh, a lot of the emails this week, Dr Beckford, and I wondered, um, in terms of us feeling quite defensive about that uh, notion of Englishness, why is that uh, and what does it tell you? I think it's, we feel defensive because Englishness is under attack. Under attack because of the breakup of the Union, Scottish nationalism, Welsh nationalism, left the British thinking, well, what about our national identity? But there's also a bigger picture in terms of Brexit, Britain feeling that it's under attack from Europe, from other parts of the world. So we're quite tender at this point in time in terms of thinking about our national identity, whether that's Englishness or Britishness. We feel we're, we're being got at. OK, I'm going to read out a couple of the comments that we've had. Um, and uh, this is from uh, various people. We'll start with Christina Doyle, who said on Facebook that when I fill in forms, I cross out British and I put English. I was born in England, so I am English and proud. So she's quite cl clearly taking back that identity. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that it, it, everybody has a right to construct their own identity. And it makes sense on the one hand, if you live in England, to, to strike the fact that you're English and to foreground that. But the reality is, it's a bit of both. You can't have Englishness without Britishness. Mm. To be, because to be English is to be part of the union. So it, it's both and rather than either or. But you can understand people feeling defensive about it in this current climate. OK, and um, there is also the aspect of... BAME, Black and uh, Minority Ethnic Community Members, who will say, we prefer to say we're British rather than English. Now, we touched on this in our survey, and it was all to do with how they felt Englishness was represented. It, it completely. I always like to say to my students, can compare the 1990s with the 1970s. In the 1970s, the flag was hijacked by the far right. I mean, you wouldn't get anybody who wasn't um, extreme having a Union Jack or a, a St George's flag flown up outside their house. You know, you ran away if you saw that. It's very different today, though. If you think of the way in which sporting events have brought all communities together and everybody's had a piece of the flag, we see the flag very differently today. But we still can't eliminate that history. And I think the only way in which we can make sense of it and maybe propel ourselves into the future is to think more positively about the flag, what it means, and how we can all appreciate it and feel proud about it. And, and that cuts across all communities, doesn't it, really? So um, you and I, both BAME, we, we also need to take ownership and take on that uh, oh, completely, identity as well. Completely. I think, oh, completely. I think one of the great things about Britishness is it's all mixed. It's the history of a mongrel nation, whether you're African Caribbean, Pakistani British, Irish British, Welsh, uh, Scottish or, or any other kind of combination. That's the history of Britain since the Angles met the Saxons, since the French invaded, you know. It's been a history where identities have been made and remade. And I think the black and minority ethnic context of contemporary Britain is just another part of that remaking. Look, one of the largest growing def uh, demographics in contemporary Birmingham, across the Midlands in the UK, people of mixed heritage. Mm. So we've got a whole new identity, um, uh, you know, mixed identity which is emerging. And that identity is going to be merged with Britishness. That's part of the dynamic of this country. And I think it's something we shouldn't be worried about or anxious about, but we should celebrate. OK. Um, just staying with the fa flags, um, Linda King said on Facebook, we need our own anthem. Scotland has one, Wales has one, Ireland has one. All we have is the national anthem, which actually we share. So, uh, again, about patriotism. I think they're completely right. I've always wondered why when I go to sporting events, you have the flower of Scotland, you know, you have these other anthems and then we sing the national anthem. It doesn't make sense. I think there's only one variation where there's a change, which is with the Commonwealth Games, where Jerusalem... Uh, yeah. The song by William Blake is actually sung. So why not have a national competition for a national anthem for England? I think it makes sense. I don't know whether or not the previous attempts to do this, Land of Hope and Glory or 
well, rule Britannia wouldn't really work it's got Britannia in there but I just think we need to find a national anthem I think Birmingham could probably come up with something you know I mean there's a lot of uh, very creative musical people in Birmingham so maybe we should get Bromis working on this yeah yeah absolutely there's scope there mm. definitely uh, Peter Dick said on Facebook I considered myself British English until I went to Scotland now I'm English and then British um, and on Twitter we have been asked is Britishness being eroded and lost due to multiculturalism. I know this is a sensitive point, but what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think with the first one, I think a lot of people who have been to Scotland and who are English get a strong sense of Scottish national identity and, and that, that, that experience gets you to reflect on your own national identity. And for some people, you just then affirm your Englishness rather than your, your Britishness. So I completely get that. I think it's wrong to think that multiculturalism is something new. Multiculture has been very much a part of English history for a thousand years. Um, you know, Vikings culture, uh, German culture, French culture. Um, these are diverse islands and diverse peoples. What we do have in the modern age is a more global dimension to diversity. People coming from all parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually a strength and builds on a strength rather than being seen as a weakness. Now, we have got the Commonwealth Games, which is coming to the Midlands, to Birmingham 2022. That is a world stage. So what sort of things do we need to be saying about Britishness and Englishness, given what you've just said about our identity and indeed our culture? I think we have to foreground the civic values that the young people talked about. The fact that this is a country that upholds traditions of democracy, traditions of justice, traditions of inclusion, traditions of welfare, the National Health Service, oh, we don't get rid of it, and the ed free education, the things that those young people celebrated and thought were really important about being British. I think those civic values are really important. But I think we should also acknowledge that we are a diverse ethnic community and that this diversity doesn't make us weak, it actually makes us much stronger. And it doesn't make us watered down, but makes us much more dynamic as a people. So I think it's those two aspects of Britishness that we need to foreground, our civic traditions that, that make us the people that we are, and also our rich, ethnic, diverse traditions that make us the great country that we are. OK, um, let's get some more comments. Um, this is a question which has come from Karen Morris, who has emailed us, and she says, if Scotland and Wales become independent, would we still see Great Britain in the same way? Uh, no, because it would dissolve the union. We would then be just maybe England and, and whoever is a part of the England. So it would completely transform the way that things are. Uh, it would lead to a, a constitutional crisis and a redesignation of what it means to be English and what Britishness means. OK, and another one. This one has come through on Facebook and it is Craig Heath who said, I'm English. How can Britain be a country when we play each other in the World Cup? I'm not mm. Scottish or Welsh. I'm English, not British. Well, Again, back well Craig, you're, it's a bit of both and and. If you're English, you're still part of the British Isles, so you can't exclude it. it it's, a, it's a bit like living in Moseley and saying you don't want to be a part of Birmingham. It, you can't. You're, the, the two work together. So it's just one of those um, conundrums that, that FIFA and UEFA churn up by virtue of having national countries, having their own national teams at football tournaments. So it's just one of those things. What I would say is, look, celebrate the fact that you could, you've got a, got a choice. You can either choose to support Wales, the Irish <laughs> yes. or, or England at football, you can, you can go with the winner, so you can never lose. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good uh, analogy as well. Um, also on Twitter, Jasmine Torito says, being British is uh, being rude to people from another country who uh, aren't white and can't speak the English language. Um, how would you like it if when you went abroad, you were told you had to go home? Now, now what, what, this is the other side of it, it is. It? I'd like to know who Jasmine's going on holiday with, because, um, uh, you know, that isn't my experience in terms of going abroad and seeing English people abroad and British people abroad. I think it's a stereotype and sometimes there's a degree of truth lurking behind a stereotype, but I don't think it's the complete picture of the British ab abroad. Not everybody behaves that way. Um, so I'd like to focus on the positive aspect that when British people do go abroad, um, most people are engaging and uh, respectful of other people's cultures and that, you know, it was going to get a few crazy people. Look, 
We could say the same thing about Americans. There's a caricature mm. that Americans are loud, brash, and um, very arrogant when they travel abroad, but it's only really a, a caricature. Only a few Americans I've ever come across on the tube or in Birmingham city centre act that way, and, and definitely not the ones that I used to hang out with at Birmingham University. But there is something about the language, isn't it? The rhetoric of go back home. Mm. Now, I certainly had that experience mm. in the 80s, but it got better, and mm. now suddenly it feels like that kind of phrasing is OK again. I think that's partly because of the Brexit predicament and the way in which it has opened up inadvertently an opportunity for people to be a bit nasty and a bit racist as well. So I think there are quite a few studies that show that the contemporary discourse from Parliament through to our politicians through to um, popular culture has provided an opportunity for people to think very narrowly about Britishness, about identity, connecting race to nation. So the idea that only if you're white, you're part of the nation and that everybody else has to go back. Well, you know, that's, that's, that's tragic. But the reality is one of the factors about being British is the civic dimension. If you have a passport, it makes you British. You know, another dimension is if you've lived here and been born here, you're, you're British. So the idea of telling people to go back home is a bit ridiculous. Where are they going to go? Um, Mosley? Uh, you know, I'm, uh, Nottingham, uh, Manchester, this is home for, for uh, uh, many people from diverse countries around the world. And I, I think that's a good thing rather than a, a negative thing. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, if everybody goes back home, we'll all be going back to Africa. You know, that's yeah. the reality. That's where our, our, our DNA um, um, comes from at this point in time. So, yeah, it's a bit of a nonsensical question, really. Yeah, and the irony is as well that when you do go back home, so to speak, they accuse you of being a foreigner anyway. So oh, actually, completely. you're quite nomadic. Oh, completely. There's a, there's a tradition in um, Jamaica of Jamaican people where my family come from going back home and being called English. So, you know, the irony is you go back home, you're English, you're here, you can be seen as different or, or a foreigner. But that... Um, dual awareness, dual consciousness can be a strength as well. You see things both ways. And I think that's part of identity which makes it really, really dynamic that we have multiple identities and also we change our identities be, be, depending on the context that we're in. When I'm with some of my English friends from school, I'm very English, mm. I'm one of the lads. When I'm with my Jamaican family, I kind of code switch and I become very Jamaican. So, you know, that's part of human nature and human identity. We shouldn't feel that's a problem. It's, it, it's, it's part of who we are and what makes us um, um, creative and dynamic. Now, you mentioned DNA and said quite rightly that if we were to trace it back to millions mm. of years, it is all in yeah. Africa. We did DNA testing of uh, volunteers in yeah. two villages in the Midlands. Yeah. Um, some were quite surprised that they weren't 100% British, but even that, 100% British in itself, means so much more, doesn't it? Because of us being an island nation and having been invaded time and time again. Well, the idea of a pure British race or Volk is a myth, mm. really, because of the history of immigration, migration, attack, war, everything else. Britain is a mongrel nation. That's, that's the reality of it. And there are also new variables to consider with multiculture, with diverse communities mixing. We're going to end up with all kinds of combinations in terms of identity, which just make purity even more of a myth. And even people, as the, the programme showed, who think that they are British are, are surprised. But look, it's true even in diverse communities. Many people who are African-Caribbean, if you go back seven, eight, nine generations, there are English people in our family as part of colonial history. There are Indian people within our history because again that's part of colonial history so yes. any myth about purity is really you know an attempt it's a defensive position rather than a open and engaged position are we perhaps a little bit ignorant about our own history in this country oh completely i mean that's one of the great debates over what should be taught in british history at school should it be a history that focuses on just these islands and a little bit of europe a bit of henry the eighth maybe the industrial revolution and then the two world wars and the one world cup you know or should it be actually about Britain's adventures overseas, Britain in Africa, Britain in Asia, Brit Britain in parts of the Caribbean. And maybe if we had a more comprehensive and global approach to British history, alongside maybe looking at the Kings and the Tudors and everybody else, we'd have a better sense of who we are as an, as an island people who are really connected to the rest of the world in many dynamic and important ways. We spoke to young people 
and I was certainly very reassured mm. by their answers about what they felt Britishness was um, and how they dealt with the whole concept of the mm. national identity. Were you quite surprised by their... Um, um, they're very keen to describe themselves as British rather than English, but, but their whole attitude towards global issues and the awareness of it. I think it's part of the technological age. Um, compared to my generation, you got your news and your understanding of the world from just three slots of news during the day. It's 24 hours now and it's on the internet. So young people are engaged in a much wider discussion about identity and who they are than any other generation in British history. My daughter is into Korean music, you know, this K-pop stuff, and most of it she gets from the internet and from on, you know, on social media. So we didn't have social media in my day or, or, or the internet, so we wouldn't get we had to wait to see what turned up in the news or top of the pops in terms of. So I think. The globalisation of media has had a profound impact on the identity of young people and I think that's a good thing because I think it makes them, one, much more open to other people around the world and secondly, they recognise that the world is also within them. They're not completely pure, they are mixed and all people are mixed in some way or the other. So I think, I think that's only a good thing going forward. OK, and just finally, uh, we celebrated the contribution of uh, some of our great... Um, uh, script writers through Shakespeare, D.H. Lawrence mm. uh, and uh, various people who we've featured on our language aspect of yeah. this series. And those are some of the things we really should promote more, shouldn't we? Because in those kind of aspects, we are leading the world. Oh, completely. But I think it's also recognising that we have to have, we have to be in what we call critical solidarity with the great people within British history. So we want to look at what the great things that they did, but also we need to be critical of some of the stuff that was maybe a bit exclusive and narrow-minded as well. And that's, that's a debate that is happening within universities at this point in time in terms of decolonising the curriculum. But I think, yes, it is important to celebrate the great things that Britain has, has accomplished, but we need to be in what we call critical solidarity, asking critical and balanced questions so we don't have one extreme view one way or the other, but a nice balanced view about, of our history. OK. Dr Beckford, thank you very much thank you, my pleasure. for your thoughts today. And uh, don't forget that if you have missed any of our Britishness series, you can head to our website and you'll watch each item there. That's itv.com slash central. For now, though, from me and Dr Beckford, thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.